Hello, everyone. So I'm Houston. I'm a Solar and Lucene PMC member and committer. I also work for Apple on the search technologies team, kind of helping with Solar and Lucene and specializing on helping people run Solar on Kubernetes. So it makes sense that I'd be giving this kind of talk. Um, so today we're going to talk about auto scaling on Kubernetes because whenever we introduced kind of Solar on Kubernetes, roughly four or three years ago, a l the first question a lot of people asked was, well, Kubernetes has auto-scaling, right? That's one of the big buzzwords around it. So if Solar is losing its auto-scaling uh, functionality, can we use Kubernetes to auto-scale Solar? Uh, and so I'm happy to say that after three years and the rest of this presentation, hopefully the answer will be yes in roughly 40 minutes. So let's get started. What exactly is like auto scaling in Kubernetes. I think it's a kind of buzzword, right? Auto scaling. And not everyone really understands what it exactly means. So let's go through it and have a kind of solid understanding first before we figure out how to use it with Solar. So auto scaling is not one thing. Auto scaling is a few different tools that come with Kubernetes and not necessarily. Um, so the first one and the most popular one is a horizontal pod, auto scaler. And so if we're talking horizontal, Kind of makes sense when you have uh, an application that is overutilized, not enough resources. Kubernetes will spin up new pods for you uh, to add more resources for your application. And likewise, if you have too few resources, I mean, too many, uh, you are use, utilizing too few of your resources, Kubernetes will lower the amount of pods so that your application is using more of the resources per pod. The vertical pod autoscaler solves the same problem in the opposite way. So if you have a very overutilized application, you don't have enough resources, instead of adding more pods, the vertical pod autoscaler will take your existing pods and give more resources to each of them, so expanding vertically. Uh, and similarly, if you have too many resources per pod, you're not utilizing all of them, they will shrink your pods, so vertically shrinking give less resources to each of your pods. The cluster autoscaler is kind of a different thing entirely. So instead of autoscaling your application, the cluster autoscaler autoscales your Kubernetes cluster itself. So if your pods are not able to run because you're, you don't have enough resources in your Kubernetes cluster, it will add new Kubernetes nodes to have more space to run these pods. And likewise, if you're spending tons of money on unutilized resources, it will take away Kubernetes nodes so that you're basically living where you need to. Cool. So we're not going to really talk about the cluster autoscaler here because we are talking about Solar, which is an application, not a Kubernetes cluster. I definitely recommend using the cluster autoscaler if you're kind of running your own Kubernetes cluster. Um, but I'm not an expert there, so I can't give that much guidance. So what exactly is the uh, horizontal pod autoscaler? It's an API that has been built into Kubernetes for a while, uh, but it has been the new version, which is v2, has been stable since Kubernetes 1.23. Um, and so as I said before, when it scales, it increases and decreases the amount of pods to kind of optimize resource utilization for your application. So let's say that we have an application that has three pods. There's a service that maps to each of these pods, and it looks like two of them are really overutilized. One of them is pretty, it's utilized well, but it's not under or overutilized. The horizontal pod autoscaler would see this, add a new pod, let it come up, and hopefully the pod would share the kind of uh, load of that application and each of the pods would then be well utilized. Um, the HPA comes with a, you know, HPA, horizontal pod autoscaler, comes with a few assumptions. And so when we added this pod, we needed to make sure that the load of the application was shared with this pod. So the assumption here is that the load should be shared across all the pods in your application. Another assumption comes when you're kind of removing pods, you're scaling down. We, we need to make sure that we can remove any pod that we need to. So the assumption here is that pods are stateless, um, which we'll get into later because we know that Solar is a very stateful application. 
So the vertical autog scaler, I'm going to skip down to the last bullet point here. Um, if you look at the Google uh, Kubernetes engine documentation, uh, it says pods using the vertical pod autoscaler should not use the JVM. Solar is a Java application, so it's kind of a mute po moot point at this stage, so uh, we're not going to really get into it very much. But as you can see, if you have underutilized, po overutilized pods, it makes your pods bigger, and eventually they kind of level off. Cool. So we are going to use the HPA. It's really the only option we have. But that's great because the HPA is really good, and it's a very popular tool amongst people trying to autoscale on Kubernetes. And it provides us a good amount of features. So first, we want to be able to say, uh, give a window as to where our pod, the number of pods shall lie. So even if we have zero requests coming in, we might not want to scale down to zero pods, right? We want to be ready. We want to be cached for whenever that first request comes in. And so you're able to set a minimum pod count to scale to. And likewise, we want to have a maximum pod count because even if a ton of requests come in, maybe we're not made of money. We don't want to scale up to like a thousand uh, solar nodes, even though we can, right? Um, so that's very helpful. But there's also things that are a little more advanced, like a stabilization window. So when you scale up or scale down, obviously it can take a little while for the resource metrics to come and figure out where they are. And so the stabilization window says after making a change. Don't do anything for the next X amount of time before I recalculate what needs to happen. So it just kind of helps you keep things nice and smooth when scaling up or scaling down. Um, and likewise with smoothness, you can throttle the amount of pods you can scale up or scale down at a time so that uh, you don't get wild inconsistencies in the number of pods that you're running. And lastly, uh, there's a lot of different metrics that you can use to kind of find out your target utilization. Uh, for your cluster. So there's built-in resource metrics, such as the CPU percentage and memory utilization for your pods. There's some custom Kubernetes resource metrics that you can use. And then finally, if you're, I mean, it makes sense. With the Solar, we have a Prometheus exporter. And so it makes sense to say, oh, let's use that, those Prometheus metrics to autoscale our cluster. And that's awesome, but it's really, really hard. So we're not going to get into it in this talk. Um, definitely a full talk afterwards worth of material. So we have Kubernetes autoscaling, and we're going to use the HPA. Now, how do we actually connect Solar to use this? Well, luckily, it's really easy, and you've been able to do it for a very long time. So the Solar Operator v030 was the first Apache release, and it came out roughly two years ago. And it supported this HPA autoscaling, because any resource in Kubernetes that has a scale subresource supports autoscaling. Um, and so the Solar Cloud has this resource, so it can be scaled just like anything else, like a deployment, a stateful set, uh, or any other custom resources that support it. And once you enable the horizontal pod autoscaler, the HPA will then control the replicas option in the Solar Cloud spec. And so you don't need to, well, you don't need to, you shouldn't be setting an explicit like three replicas, four replicas. You'll just leave that empty and let the HPA handle that for you. And so I've said it's pretty easy. This is exactly how you do it. So you make your solar cloud. You don't provide your replicas. And then you create this horizontal pod autoscaler resource. We will just call it example, give it a minimum and maximum replicas, and tell it that we want an average CPU utilization across our pods of 25%. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see we're passing it that we're autoscaling a solar cloud. And the name of that solar cloud is example. Well, so that's pretty simple, I think. Um, what's not simple is choosing the metrics to scale solar on. Um, so I mean, I think there's so many different, like there's hundreds of metrics you could choose here, right? And not one metric will fit everyone's needs. A lot of people use solar for a lot of different reasons. And so I can't stand up here and tell you, oh, yeah, auto scale on queries per second. Because some people are more ingest heavy than they are query heavy. And some people are worried about their disk space instead of their CPU utilization. So you just need to kind of introspect, see what you all really care about, and auto scale based on those metrics. Awesome. So we've shown that it's pretty easy to connect solar to the Kubernetes autoscaling. 
But I'd said that there were two assumptions that come when we choose the HPA. We need our application to be stateless, and we need to share load across our entire cluster. That is not how Solar works. Um, so we need to do some fun things to make Solar work with the HPA, and that is scaling Solar smartly. So let's go with our first assumption. Solar is stateless. Solar is not stateless. Um, this is because Solar knows exactly where the data lives on each of its nodes or pods, right? That's in the cluster state. So even though we will hopefully uh, replicate data across multiple pods, if we take one of these pods down, Solar will expect those, the replicas or data that lives on that pod to eventually come back. And so we can still serve queries, we can still update, everything works fine, but Solar will be unhappy because that data is supposed to be there and it isn't. Um, so what we need to do to make Solar happy is move the data off of these replicas before we delete the pod. And so this is what we use the replace node API for. Um, so for scaling down by one pod, that's fine. We just replace that node and let Solar choose where to put those replicas from that node. And once that happens, we can delete the pod after there's no data left on the pod. Um, if we want to scale down multiple nodes at a time, we still need to we, replace node doesn't work with multiple nodes, so we still need to scale down by one, scale by down one until we get to our desired replica count, desired pod count. Um, but some future API work can make it a lot easier if we can just migrate replicas from multiple nodes to the other nodes. Um, but we have something that works here. So once the replicas are moved, we can delete the pod. Cool. So now Solar is kind of quote unquote stateless. We can remove a no Solar pod whenever we need to. Awesome. For scaling up Solar pods, this is kind of easy, right? You can just create a new pod. Solar has no issue with empty pods, right? So it is quote, 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 stateless at that point. However, it breaks the second assumption that we talked about with HPAs, which is the load of your application should be shared across all the pods in that application. And so while there are certain tasks that an empty pod can help with in Solar, most of the load, I'm going to say this with a caveat, Maybe not for everyone, but most of the load for most people is going to be happening on pods that have data on them. Um, and so this new pod that we add is not going to help that much with the uh, utilization of our cluster. So what we need to do once we've added a new pod is utilize, like move replicas from the old pods to this new pod. There used to be an API to do this called the Utilize Node API when auto-scaling existed in Solar 8. However, when it was removed, this API was removed as well. So fun, we get to create a new Solar API. Uh, and thanks to Radu, this is not just utilizing a new node. We are now kind of expanding the use case of this. So uh, the new API is called Balanced Replicas. So given a set of nodes, or by default, all the nodes in your Solar Cloud, move the replicas across until you find a balance of replicas across all the nodes. And so this is exactly what we want, right? We want to share the load across all of the pods in our Solar Cloud. Uh, and so this is a new API in Solar 9.3. So obviously, you're not going to get this if you're not running on the most latest Solar version, which isn't even released yet. Um, but in the future, hopefully, more people are using it and are able to scale up more nicely with this new API. Awesome. So migrating data is tricky, right? Like any time we change or move around data, we want to make sure that that works because, I mean, who wants to use a feature where you might lose your data when you scale up because you're getting a lot of requests? That's the opposite of what you want. You want your, sol your solar cloud to be more stable than less stable. And so when we introduce these new kind of manage scale up and manage scale down features, we needed to think about how to kind of do it in a way that ensures data integrity. Um, and so operators don't sh store any state in them, like the solar operator. It, all, it only knows the state of a Kubernetes cluster and the state of possibly your solar cluster. And so what we can do is operate via locks. So if we want to start an operation, we need to make sure that operation finishes, or else we don't know where the data is living, right? 
We don't know if the command has finished, if it's running. We need to kind of keep control of the actions that we start and make sure that we understand how they finish. And so in this new version of the software operator, we're in, like, including cluster operation locks that will let us understand what is running at a given time, make sure that we're not running two different commands uh, that are doing different things. Like we don't want to scale up and scale down at the same time if the user is doing some weird things with their configuration. Um, and so the locks let us ensure that only one operation can have a lock on the cluster at a given time. And if a lock is acquired on the solar cloud, that that, lock, that operation must complete before the lock can be given up. And so even if the solar, the user kind of scales back down and kind of stops the scale up operation halfway through, we want to make sure that the operation finishes before we try to undo it. And locks kind of let us do that. Cool. So here's the fun part. Um, I have a demo for you all about how all of this works. I'm a coward, though, so I'm not going to do it live. I've uh, I recorded this, but I'm going to talk over it. Um, so let's get started. Let's start from the beginning, I guess. OK, here we go. So first, we want to install Solar into a new empty Kubernetes cluster. So we go to Artifact Hub to find the Helm chart for Solar. Um, we can see here that, oh, we need to install the Solar Operator first. That makes sense. Let's go to the Solar Operator and, and uh, follow the instructions to install it. So the first thing we do is we install the CRDs. And so we just follow this nice little command that's included. Uh, there's a command that also, if you're upgrading the Solar Cloud version, it's also included in the Helm chart. This is going to take maybe a few minutes, uh, seconds. So let's go ahead and do the other steps too. So install, add the Solar Helm repo, which I've already done, but that's OK. And then follow commands to actually install the Solar Operator. This is what makes it possible to run Solar on Kubernetes. And since uh, we're running a pre-release version, I need to set a custom image and tag here. And I'll provide that later for anyone that wants to try it out. Awesome. So the Solar Operator is now installed. Good to go there. Let's install Solar. Uh, and so I've provided, I'm using an example Solar Cloud that is very similar to one of the ones in the example directory in the Solar Operator. Uh, and the only thing I've really done is remove some of the fluff, but also I uh, used a custom repository and tag, which is just the nightly image, uh, because we're using uh, Solar 9.3 hasn't been released yet. Awesome. So you can see here we have 500 milli, milli CPUs and around one gigabyte of memory. So let's create this Solar Cloud and uh, wait for it to come up. So create it. And then another window, we're going to watch as it comes alive. Uh, this can take a little bit of time, so we're going to speed up here. Um, and after around 80 seconds, we have a fully working solar cloud. But it's empty, and we can't really do anything with an empty cluster, right? So we're going to use kubectl port forward to kind of get a look into the admin UI of our solar cloud. Once that comes up, load it up. Awesome. And so now we can look at our cloud. There's nothing living on it, but we have three nodes. And then let's go and create a collection. So if we're going to do some auto-scaling, we need a good amount of replicas. Let's choose 12 replicas. And it's better to use more shards than replicas in this example, because we need to be able to move them around pretty uh, willy-nilly. We'll wait for them to come up. And cool. If we go back, we'll have 12, uh, 12 replicas. So four replicas for each of our three nodes. Awesome. Well, now we can start auto-scaling. We have data. So we're going to use the wonderful kubectl autoscale uh, command and set a minimum replicas of three, a maximum replicas of seven, and a target CPU percentage of 20%. And we're going to quickly just edit this uh, horizontal pod autoscaler to make things work a little faster. I told you all about the stabilization window before. The default stabilization window is five minutes, and I did not want to wait five minutes for everything to happen in this demo. So we're going to set it to 20 seconds, um, which will 
let us go a lot faster. And now that our HPA is created, we can go watch our APA just like we're watching our solar cloud. And this will kind of let us see how everything is working. Cool. And so as you can see below, um, if you're looking at the HPA, it actually doesn't know what the CPU percentage of our pods is. That's because we haven't installed the metrics server for Kubernetes. Um, and so the first thing we do is just look at the Kubernetes documentation to install the metrics server. Uh, it's pretty easy. You just add the Helm repo and then install the metrics server itself. Because, well, we need this because the HPA doesn't actually know what the CPU percentage of our pods is. We need metrics for that. And so the default metrics for Kubernetes come through the uh, metric server. Awesome. And so if we wait a little bit after that, and we'll speed this up, uh, eventually down below, you can see that we get 3% CPU utilization for our pods. Well, that's not going to help. We're not using any requests, right? So if you go to the walkthrough for the HPA on Kubernetes documentation, they provide a nice little command to simulate load. So we're going to use that, but use the select handler for our test collection and send a request every 333, second, uh, 333 requests per second. Um, and so we're also going to log any errors that we see. And so after a little bit of time, you can see that our CPU utilization jumped to 65%. That's way higher than 20%, right? So Kubernetes, the HPA has bumped up our desired nodes to seven. And so solar has increased the stateful set size to seven. So we need to wait for these nodes to come online. You can see over time, they do. And finally, when we have seven nodes, they're all empty. And so then the solar operator will call the balance replicas API. And then we'll see slowly the replicas start to balance across the nodes. And since we have seven pods and 12 replicas, we're going to end up with five, repl uh, five nodes with two replicas and two pods with one replica each. And you can see that's what we have at the end. So balance replica works. Wonderful. Um, and so thank you. <laughs> and so you can see here that the CPU utilization goes down to 20%. We, it hit it right on the dot, um, which isn't good for this demo because we want to see it scale down. So let's decrease our load to roughly um, from 333 requests per second to 250 requests per second. Um, and so at this point, we should see our CPU utilization go down, right? And so then we will, if we wait a little bit, we'll actually see that happen. So it goes from 20% to 14%. And so the HP says, oh, you only need five pods now. And so we'll see the solar goes down to six pods because we go one at a time. It'll move the replicas off of the pod. And then once there's no replicas, it'll delete the pod. And bye-bye. And so now we have another one to remove. So it'll remove the replicas from the pod. They're gone. And so now we'll delete the pod. And we'll end up with five pods total and an even balance of replicas across each pod. Perfect. And so I said before that we are logging any errors that we see from our requests. We're doing all these really fast requests, right? I know we don't have any data, but that's fine. Um, but we want to show, oh, you see here, it keeps scaling down because the CPU utilization is still underutilized. It still works. Um, and so let's delete our example and show that if we do delete it, we see errors where we didn't see any errors from our request while um, we were doing uh, the auto scaling. So even though we were auto scaling up and down, we didn't see any issues with the solar request, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. Awesome. Go back to here. So that was our demo. Awesome. So I showed in here lots of replica migration here. This is what we talked about in the scaling solar section, which is the balance replicas API and replace node API. So let's talk about how that actually works. Replica migration. So the balance replica and the replace node are basically the two things that the solar operator right now uses to move replicas across pods. Uh, and if you're not familiar with kind of how this works in solar, starting in solar 8, when the uh, auto scaling was starting to be removed, uh, placement plugins were introduced. So this is basically plugins to determine how to place replicas. 
There are four by default, simple, random, minimized cores, and affinity. Simple is the default one, but affinity is probably the one you use. It's, it has a lot more features, and it's way more complex. Um, and so as you can imagine, each of these has different logic for determining where the replicas live, because why else wouldn't you have different placement plugins, right? Um, but when building a new API for balancing replicas, balancing is a lot harder than just determining where a new replica should live. And so I didn't want to write four of these implementations, and I didn't want to make uh, people who have custom placement plugins write this either. And so we want to simplify this. We want to have an assumption that nodes have weights. And if this assumption is true, then it's a lot easier to make these decisions. When you add replicas, choose the nodes that would be weighted the least if we added the replicas to them. We want to have the low, like if a weight is utilization, we want to keep low utilization, right? If we're removing replicas, take them from the nodes that are the most utilized. That makes sense. So the nodes with the highest weights, remove the replicas from. If we're balancing replicas, let's go with the Robinhood approach. Take from the wealthy nodes, or the nodes with high weights, and give them to the nodes with low weights. Um, and so with this one assumption, we have kind of, we're able to make one class that has all the logic that can satisfy all of our placement plugins. So all of the placement plugins just need to implement ordered node placement plugin and do one thing, which is provide a weighted node. And obviously, each of these nodes have a different, uh, each of these placement plugins has a different idea of what a weight is. So the minimized cores, a weight is just the number of cores on the node. Affinity has a much more complex calculation for what a weight is. Um, and random, obviously, a weight is zero. You, you randomly decide where to put no, uh, replicas. Um, and so each of these placement plugins don't actually need to think about the logic of how to add, replace, or move replicas. All they need to think about is, what is the weight of this node? And if I, how do I add, like, how, do, how does the weight change if I add a replica? And how does the weight change if I delete a replica? So let's go through what this logic actually looks like. So let's say that I want to add two replicas to our cluster with two nodes. It has a weight of 10 and a weight of 12. So we are going to create a heap, because we only care about the lowest weighted nodes. And we're going to sort this heap by the weight if we added the replica there, as we said before. So what we do first is just remove the lowest weighted pod, add the replica, we get a new weight. Now we need to calculate the weight if we added the replica again. OK, so the weight is 18 now. We add it back to our heap, and it's going to be sorted above pod 0. OK, so we repeat. We still have another replica to add. We take the lowest weighted pod, we take it out, we add the replica, and we add it back in. Cool. And so at the end, we have no more replicas to add, so we end up with adding one replica to each of our pods. Pretty simple. Balanced replicas, not as simple, but that's fine. We'll get through it. So let's start off with a little more complex cluster. We want to balance the replicas, so let's start with a pretty unbalanced cluster. So we have one pod with four replicas, one pod with two replicas, and one pod that's empty. Uh, and so the first thing we need to do here is, once again, create a sorted representation of this. But here we need to access the lowest and the highest weight, our Robinhood system, right? Um, and so we need uh, a fully sorted list. Um, and so here, the first thing we do is the same. We take out the lowest weighted node, so pod 2. Now we take out the highest weighted node, which is going to be pod 0. And we try to move any replica from pod 0 to pod 2. And so let's check the first replica. OK, we can move it. But it needs to satisfy two rules, e one of two rules. Either the new weight of the combined, either the new combined weight of the pods is lower than before. So overall, we have lowered our uh, utilization of the cluster. Or the, we didn't overcorrect. So the, new, uh, the lower weighted pod is not weighted higher than the higher weighted pod after moving the replica, because that's overcorrection. And we don't want to overcorrect here. So first thing we try is moving the first replica. And so the new combined weight is 15, which is the same as the com old combined weight. So that rule is broken. Uh, so let's try the next replica. So the new combined weight is the same as the old combined weight. Um, and that, is, that rule is broken, but 
the ordering of the nodes does not shift after. So the new weight of pod 2 is 3, and the new weight of pod 0 is 12, and so pod, three will, uh, pod 2 will still be weighted lower than pod 12. OK, so let's move that replica. Awesome. And once we've moved the replica, we add these uh, pods back into our sorted list and do it again. So we take out pod 2, and then we take out pod 0, because they're still the lowest and the highest weighted pods. And so we didn't try to move these replicas across. And so, OK, first we have a problem. We can't move this replica to pod 2. Let's say that it's the same shard as the replica that already exists there. That's fine. We move, move, we move on to the next replica. Oh, this one also has a problem. We can't move it. We can't remove that replica from pod 0. Let's say that it's a co-located collection. And if we move that, the next replica it won't be co-located with it anymore. OK, so we can't move this replica. Let's move on to the next one. Well, this one we also can't move to pod 2. Well, that's a problem. So we can't move any replicas from pod 2 to pod 0. So at this point, let's stash pod 0 away and move on to the next highest weighted node. OK. So now we're looking at pod 1. We don't care about pod 0 anymore. So we try to move the first replica. Ugh, we can't move this replica either. OK, fine. Let's move on to the next replica. Finally, we're able to do it. So our second rule is broken. The ordering of the nodes does shift after. So pod 2 is going to be weighted higher than pod 1 after the move. However, the combined weight is 12, where the combined weight before the move was 13. So we've overall lowered our utilization of the cluster. So this works, and we can add it back to the list. And now we go to our stashed ones. So we still care about pod 0, so we add it back. And so the overall weight is 5, 7, and 12 now. So we kind of repeat this process until we end up with an overall weighting of things are kind of differing by, at most, a weight of 1. Awesome. So we have kind of optimally balanced the replicas across our solar cloud here by just using weights and determining if we can add and remove replicas from a node. So let's, we've kind of done a demo. We've showed how this all works. What is the state of this project? Because I told you it's not actually released yet. So the project is the Solar Improvement Proposal 17. You can follow it on whatever Solar uses for SIPs. Um, but there's two kind of umbrella issues. There's the solar operator work, and there's the solar work. And so you can follow issue 536. So that's targeting a V080 release, hopefully in July, uh, to get managed scale up and managed scale down in, the next, in solar operator by default. Um, and the managed scale down is merged, but the scale up still requires a few reviews. As you can see, it works, but yeah, code reviews are good. Um, so the solar part, which is the balanced replicas API that I talked about, you can follow the solar 16727, and we're going to target for a 9.3 release because it's already been merged in. It just hasn't been released yet. Uh, and so if you want to try this out yourself, you can use the Solar Nightly image, because it's been merged. And uh, that spills every night, obviously. And that's the Docker location of it. And then we don't do nightly images as a solar operator, but I've created one for you to use in my repo. So you can use that. Um, and it works with the CRDs from the v070 release. So you don't need to worry about changing your CRDs to test this out. I want to give a big thank you to Tomas, Radu, and Jason um, for so many things, helping with the V2OPAs, Jason, and uh, Radu and Tomas for helping review very, very, very large PRs and uh, kind of leading me down the right path with the Valance Replicas API. So I think we have a good amount of time for questions. Uh, really appreciate the talk. I think one of the things that you pointed out that's very difficult is knowing what metric to pick. Um, have you considered doing like a multi-metric, a, a cumulative or aggregated yes. metric? So um, for aggregating metrics to kind of scale on multiple metrics, that's supported in the V2 HPA. So it's definitely something that can be done. Um, to be honest, I was merging code last week, so I haven't had too much of a time to experiment with different metrics. But I mean, as I said, just choosing metrics for scaling solar could be at its own talk, including all the Prometheus ones. So um, there's still a ton of research to be done in that area.
Thank you for your talk. Um, we are already using the solar operator. Um, mm -hmm. And one issue we found when experimenting uh, is that uh, when, so with n not auto scaling, but uh, a, a node dies. Yeah. Um, and it comes back, uh, it's not populated. So we have ah. to manually interact uh, yeah. to get the replicas back. Will this be solved with a, a balanced thing? This, so balance doesn't actually remove replicas that are in the cluster state that don't exist locally. So you're seeing this problem because you're not using uh, persistent volumes, right? You're using the kind of ephemeral state. Yeah. Yeah. And so balance replicas can solve that, but the replace, uh, there is, you can manually call delete node, which will delete those replicas, and then you can create the replicas back that should exist. So that's kind of a tangential thing that we could add to the solar operator to kind of fix these things after they happen. Um, but unfortunately, balance replicas won't fix that yet. OK. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, when talking about uh, resources like CPU or disk, yeah. um, is there a way to differentiate between uh, we are bulk uploading a new update of some million documents and a user query? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's kind of going to what Ken was talking about. We can choose different metrics here. So the solar Prometheus exporter has those metrics differentiated, right? You can auto scale based on just your queries per second or your updates per second. Um, so this is then solved with the Prometheus one, yeah. Yes, okay. but once again, that's very hard. So I think Radu was talking to me about different Kubernetes auto scaling techniques that kind of extend the HPA. Um, I do not remember the name, but there are kind of external applications that make it easier than trying to use Prometheus with the HPA, which is hard. So uh, if you're on video, email Radu. He has the answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. Oh, there we go. I also have some question because uh, this is in most cases very, very well if you have large clusters with many, many cores and so on. But if you only have something like one core with many nodes and you have the thing you want to scale up, yes. um, it doesn't make sense to just shift those replicas to, to the single node. So is there also the possibility to simply say, uh, before you are switching off the pod, change uh, the... Uh, the core to have one less no, uh, replica, and then you can simply delete it. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. So um, this is something I was going to mention. So this is kind of auto scaling nodes, but auto scaling replicas is just as important, right? And so this is the first step of the auto scaling process. But we really do hope down the line that auto scaling repli like your replication factor up and down, uh, will be kind of included as a part of this. Radu didn't volunteer for that, but he did mention it. So, I mean, if you mention something, I don't know. <laughs> so, regarding the uh, balanced replicas, it yeah. sounds like uh, a lot of the rebalancing you're doing, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's shuffling to kind of, uh, like, you're resorting uh, the weights of your replicas and how they fit into the stateful sets. Um, would it be fair to say, like, you're kind of, uh, if you were managing pods directly instead of using the stateful sets, you would have more flexibility to do things directly in the operator? Or I like don't think so. So the balance replicas doesn't really have to do with the stateful set. It has to do with the internal management of data within Solar. And so no matter how the pods are run, we need to move data around from pod to pod. Um, the staple set thing does provide its own kind of constraints with like, let's say the affinity placement plugin and being able to like use different domains and like availability zones. But um, I would say in general, the staple set buys us a lot of things, uh, more, a lot more than it costs us. Hi. Um what sort of real world performance have you seen for balanced replicas and what implication does that have for scaling with uh, load changes? That's a very good question. Um, the real world, 
is really just on my laptop so far. It was merged into Solar like four days ago. Um, so we don't have those numbers yet. In the same thing that we're using, so the ordered node placement plugin utilizes very similar logic to place replicas, right? And so we actually saw the affinity node placement plugin test in Solar has a scale test. And with this new logic, the time for that test to run went from like five seconds to like three seconds. So it is somehow faster than it used to be. Um, I, that's pure luck, no skill there. Um, but I would, I would say it's not optimized yet. Like obviously getting something in there that works is better than iterating to infinity. Um, there's definitely room for improvements. Thanks. Are there any other questions? All right. Oh, one more. You were mentioning locks um, oh. and locking operations. Yes. That sounds like it could end up dangerous. Uh, yeah, I was going to say deadlocks are an issue. Um, we'll end it there. Uh, deadlocks are an issue. Um, I think the code is pretty good right now, but like, um, because the thing is, deadlocks are somewhat easy to solve here because we keep iterating, like the reconcile loop will keep going in the solar operator until we hit a resolution. So yeah, maybe the scale operation can't work, but if a failure happens, we'll give up the lock and then try it again. So another operation can happen in the meantime. So let's say you need to do a managed update because, oh no, the new pods, like I changed the spec of the pods and the new pods don't work, but I'm trying to scale it up so the scale up doesn't work, we can fail the scale up and then do the managed updates so that the new pod template actually kind of takes effect and the new pods will come up healthy and then we will retry the scale up operation. Sorry. I'm not saying that that's what happens now, but by the time 080 comes out, it'll be nice. <laughs> so a lot has to do with you failing jobs appropriately. Yeah, it's, it's all about man like handling failure better. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Are there any other questions? We have oh, we room have for question. one. Oh, cool. OK. I think we are, we are out of questions. I think these people want to eat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And see you after lunch.